This is an exciting day for Maryland. Uh, we are now one big step closer to reaching that light at the end of the tunnel that we've all been talking about. Uh, today, exactly one year after confirming the first Maryland death from COVID-19, our state has officially surpassed the milestone of 2 million vaccines administered. It took 67 days to reach the first million doses, but just 27 days to double that and reach 2 million doses administered. Maryland is uh, vaccinating residents at a faster rate than 34 other states. We vaccinated more people than 34 other states. Uh, and administered more vaccines at long-term care facilities than 37 other states. Uh, we're now averaging a record 43,034 shots per day, which is an increase of more than 1,300 percent. Thanks to Secretary Schrader and his team at the uh, Maryland Department of Health, as of today, nearly 25 percent of all Marylanders have gotten a vaccine, including nearly two-thirds of all Marylanders over 65. We have now have an infrastructure capable of doing uh, 100,000 shots or more per day. As of today, the uh, Six Flags America vaccination site has done more than 100,000 vaccines. Tomorrow, I will be making numerous stops all across the Eastern Shore, uh, including the new mass vaccination site at the Wicomico Youth and Civic Center in Salisbury. Uh, we will open our sixth mass vaccination site one week from today in Western Maryland. In addition, we're in ongoing discussions with a number of other jurisdictions regarding additional mass vac sites, and we'll likely be making further announcements regarding that in the coming days. We now have uh, 2,424 different distribution points all across the state of Maryland. Uh, Maryland created the most advanced equity plan in the country, uh, which continues to focus like a laser on our efforts to reach underserved communities. In early January, we launched the Maryland Vaccine Equity Task Force, which is working with trusted community leaders and local health departments to focus COVID-19 vaccination efforts in vulnerable, hard-to-reach populations. Fifty task force missions have already been completed or are currently in progress all around the state, with more to come. As I've uh, repeatedly stressed, the biggest challenge that uh, we're faced with continues to be supply. That's what uh, all states uh, are currently receiving uh, a limited supply from the federal government. Uh, fortunately, there's uh, finally some really good progress on that front. Uh, last week, um, you all heard President Biden announce uh, that uh, every adult in the United States would be eligible uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine no later than May 1st. Earlier this week, we had a meeting with the White House Coronavirus Task Force where America's governors were informed that not this week or next week, uh, but beginning the week of March 29, all states would begin to see a significant increase in vaccine supply. And based on Maryland's rapidly accelerating vaccination rate, uh, the infrastructure that we have built, and this anticipated increase in vaccine supply from the federal government, uh, today I am pleased to announce that the state of Maryland will now enter phase two of our COVID-19 vaccine plan. Uh, beginning Tuesday, next Tuesday, March 23rd, under uh, phase 2A, all Marylanders age 60 and older will be eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. And immediately, effective today, uh, any Marylander over the age of 60 can pre-register for a COVID-19 vaccine appointment at any of the state's mass vaccination sites by visiting covidvax.maryland.gov uh, or by calling the state's COVID-19 vaccination support center at 1-855-MD-GOVAX. Once pre-registered on our new registration system, eligible Marylanders will then be notified uh, once an appointment is available and will be able to verify their pre-registration status and reserve appointments for vaccines. Uh, nearly 90% of the state's 7,000 
929 COVID deaths have been Marylanders over the age of 60. Uh, by prioritizing this age group, we will take a huge leap forward in the effort to protect our most vulnerable citizens from this virus. One week later, on Tuesday, March 30th, we will move into phase 2B of our plan, which will include all Marylanders 16 years and older with underlying medical conditions that increase the risk for severe COVID-19 illness, and they can start to be vaccinated. Uh, according to the CDC, nearly 90% of all the individuals hospitalized for COVID-19 have had an underlying medical condition. Uh, the third and final wave of Marylanders in phase two uh, will become eligible for COVID vac vaccines beginning April 13th. This uh, phase two includes all Marylanders 55 and older, as well as all essential workers of any age in critical industries, uh, including food services, utilities, construction workers, financial services, IT, and many other infrastructure categories. Uh, finally, uh, no later than Tuesday, April 27, Maryland will enter the final phase three group, which will include every single Marylander over the age of 16. I want to stress that even though uh, we're now moving into phase two of our vaccine plan, um, all individuals who are currently eligible under phase one, uh, but have not yet been vaccinated, will continue to be prioritized for appointments at all of our mass vaccination sites. I also want to continue to remind uh, Marylanders that just because you become eligible for a vaccine does not mean that you can immediately get a vaccine uh, and that we can't schedule appointments for vaccines that we don't have or that don't yet exist. Uh, supply will be ramping up to meet all of the demand, but to be clear, we do expect that demand will continue to outpace the supply for at least the next several weeks. Uh, with the announcement of this plan, now every single Marylander knows when they become eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Our goal throughout this process remains the same. Uh, we do not want to leave any Marylander behind. And to achieve that goal, equally as important as moving forward with our phased, uh, data-based, well-thought-out vaccination plan is uh, to also continue expanding the channels available to Marylanders to get vaccinated. Uh, in addition to the current uh, six mass vaccination sites, we have clinics at 227 nursing homes and 1,700 assisted living facilities. Uh, as of today, we're now increasing to 275 pharmacies, 38 hospitals, and our 24 county health departments. Our plan calls for the number of distribution points to continue to grow nearly every day. Uh, in addition, today we are launching an innovative pilot program uh, to provide vaccine doses directly to primary care practices throughout the state. All, all these steps allow us to continue to provide a faster, a more equitable vaccination response in Maryland. Uh, Maryland's primary care practices have been essential in our COVID-19 uh, response here in Maryland from pivoting to telehealth services to standing up COVID testing clinics. These providers have, well, they already have trusted long standing relationships with their patients, which are critical to helping us boost vaccine efforts. And with this innovative program, primary care providers will be able to call their patients directly to schedule vaccine appointments, which will minimize uh, technological and access barriers and reach individuals where they are. This initial pilot uh, that we're launching today will include 37 practices throughout the state, including ones that serve largely African-American and Hispanic patients and those that serve communities with less geographic access to other uh, vaccination sites. And this program is made possible through an existing partnership uh, of primary care and public health uh, within the Maryland Primary Care Program, which is a statewide advanced program that connects 
the Maryland Department of Health with 562 uh, primary care practices across the state. In addition, uh, we are launching a new $12 million COVID-19 community vaccination program led by the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission. This program uh, will fund hospital-led community-based vaccination initiatives uh, by utilizing Maryland's one-of-a-kind Maryland model uh, health care finance system, which was initially conceived, uh, designed, and accomplished by Secretary Dennis Schrader, and which has been called the most innovative in America. Uh, as uh, leading health care providers in our communities, hospitals are uniquely positioned to support local community-based vaccination efforts. Many have already partnered with us to undertake vaccination efforts all across the state, uh, and including through partnerships with local health departments and community-based organizations. But through this new grant program, hospitals will now be able to expand uh, to work with even more trusted community partners, including uh, local health departments, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, and others, to increase Marylanders' access to the COVID-19 vaccine with a focus on vulnerable, underserved, and hard-to-reach areas. From day one, our state has played an outsized role in the fight against COVID-19. More than 40 Maryland companies and institutions have been involved in developing tests, COVID-19 vaccines, and therapeutics. And Maryland has led the nation throughout this COVID crisis, and we're continuing to lead with our vaccination efforts. And now we are the only state in the nation that has the infrastructure already in place to launch a partnership of this kind uh, with our state's hospitals. Finally, today, uh, through the Maryland Vaccine Equity Task Force, led by General Burkhead, uh, we are announcing the launch of mobile vaccine clinics in hard-to-reach rural areas of the state. And by utilizing mobile units provided by the Maryland School of Nursing, these units will be deployed and staffed by the Maryland National Guard. And I'm looking forward to seeing them in action uh, tomorrow with the General on the Eastern Shore. As we continue to leverage every possible resource we can uh, to get shots into arms as efficiently and equitably as possible. We have built the infrastructure capacity and we're, and we're being promised the increased uh, supply to be able to vaccinate every Marylander in the next couple months. I can assure you that Secretary Schrader and our entire team will not rest until every single Marylander who wants a vaccine has received a vaccine. And I want to, thank, I want to ask all Marylanders uh, to please get vaccinated when it's your turn. Uh, these COVID-19 vaccines have been proven to be safe and effective. They're administered under medical supervision. And getting vaccinated is absolutely vital to stopping the spread of COVID-19 so that we can return to normal life once again. Um, I want to sincerely thank all of the vaccinators, uh, the Maryland State Health Department, the Maryland National Guard, our hospitals, pharmacies, and local health departments, and the literally thousands of dedicated people who have been literally working around the clock seven days a week to help us reach this moment. And we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Adam Kane, the chairman of the Maryland uh, Health Services Cost Review Commission. He's going to provide a little more detail on our uh, new first-of-its-kind Maryland model uh, hospital provider vaccine equity program. Thank you, Governor. Maryland's hospitals and health systems are here to answer your call and continue to answer your call to leave no Marylander behind in this great endeavor. On behalf of the seven commissioners on the Health Services Cost Review Commission and the 50 dedicated staff, I want to, I'm pleased to announce that we will be meeting next week to create this community vaccination program. Maryland's unique rate setting agency governs all 47 acute care hospitals. Maryland's hospitals have been providing 
care to COVID and frankly, lots of non-COVID medical need throughout the past year and are truly heroes. And I would like to thank, join the governor in thanking Maryland's hospitals, healthcare workers, nursing home workers, and all senior living communities who played an outside role with this very strong state and the strong state response. The HSCRC will be making applications available for all Maryland hospitals March 25th for a rolling funding program. $12 million, $12 million as the governor said, will be immediately available to expand vaccination programs to vulnerable populations. Hospitals will be working clo closely with local health departments using technology through CRISP and other means to identify vulnerable zip codes and, and provide access to vaccines by any means necessary. We know that relationships between hospitals, doctors, nurses are really what's going to get vaccinations out to the most vulnerable populations. And we know this, this important program will contribute to that effort. As the governor mentioned, this program, as well as the Maryland Primary Care Program, is very much uh, related to Maryland's unique all-payer total cost of care contract that we have with the federal government. The total cost of care contract focuses our health systems and efforts on improving health outcomes, improving population health, and managing chronic diseases. The contract was so ably negotiated by the governor and Secretary Schrader back in 2019, even before any of the COVID pandemic was on anybody's mind. So we are very pleased to be able to use the tools under this waiver to accomplish this very important goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Dr. Howard Haft. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Primary Care Program, which is a uh, division under the Maryland Department of Health and, and Public Health. And I'd like to start by, by thanking Governor Hogan, uh, General Burkhead, Adam, um, and, and the Secretary Schrader for their leadership throughout this crisis. Um, it's really been remarkable how so many people have come together to address this, um, this horrible pandemic in so many ways, particularly now with vaccines and, and the search, ongoing search for equity. Um, I have to say that the governor was uh, eloquent in, uh, in almost completely reading my talking points. So I have little to add except to say that um, echoing what, uh, what Mr. Kane said, that um, it's again because of the forethought um, of having a Maryland model where hospitals are organized and, and providers are organized together, that they're able to respond to these kinds of crises in a unified way under the direction of leadership um, and be able to do what they specifically are able to do. In the case of primary care providers, as I said, we have 562 sites across the state that are organized under the Department of Health and Secretary Schrader who stand at the ready and have stood at the ready to respond in every way to this crisis and now are beginning to respond in terms of being vaccinators. And as the governor said, they have a special way of adding their resources to this fight. Um, it's, it, this is clearly an and situation. It's using the great resources that we have at the mass vac sites. It's the resources that we have at hospitals, at, at pharmacies, at local health departments, and now also those resources from, local, from our, our community providers who have a special relationship with their patients and who can address issues of vaccine hesitancy when necessary in a personal way. They're in the communities much the same as pharmacies are. They have the ability to directly reach out to their patients in an equitable way and identify those who are in most need. And as we enter into phase two of of this process. Um, they will also be able to be at the ready to identify those who have underlying medical conditions. So I think it's remarkable and I thank everyone here for their efforts and, and we look forward to the efforts that our primary care providers will make, what their, their practices will make, their, their staff will make in adding to um, into winning this, um, this battle in the war against COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Hogan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always an honor to get a chance to talk about what a wonderful partnership we've had working with the Vaccine Equity Task Force and the community. And um, we are pleased to work with the Maryland Primary Care 
Program and the Maryland Health, Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um, the Maryland Primary Care Program practices are working with the Vaccine Equity Task Force already, uh, trusted leaders and partners and locations. And these are two of the tenants that we've already seen work well. The primary care providers establish trusted relationships which allows Marylanders to receive information from knowledgeable sources, but also to the ability to dialogue directly with their providers. And we realize how important that is. Providers will connect with the patients, schedule employ appointments to minimize technology and access barriers. Moreover, they are usually located in an accessible area or an area where that patient is familiar with going. This will minimize and, and mitigate barriers for travels for individuals. As we've demonstrated with our faith-based faith organizations, trusted voices are important, and so are hospitals. The trusted healthcare Maryland institutions, such as Holy Cross and Johns Hopkins and UMS, uh, have worked with the vaccine task force since we stood up, and we will continue to work in tandem with them in various locations across Maryland. We are, we are looking forward to working with the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission on their COVID-19 community vaccination funding program to create opportunities to strengthen community partnerships and support long-term sustainable initiatives with, that will address health care disparities. The COVID-19 Community Vaccination Funding Program will help to optimize and expand the hospital's existing community-based programs. This program aligns really well with the Vaccine Equity Task Force's current mission to increase statewide vaccination rate and particularly to get into underserved areas in Maryland. This will accelerate our efforts and grow our initiatives. On Friday, we will launch the wellness buses or the mass of the mobile vax to assist in the acceleration of getting vaccine into hard to reach areas on the Maryland's Eastern shore. This is another way to meet people where they are. These vehicles were obtained through a partnership agreement with UMS and the vaccine equity task force. And I have to give a shout out to the Maryland army national guard where our maintenance shop in Dundalk spent tireless hours fixing these buses to be ready to roll in the communities. Each mobile vaccine bus has the versatility to be used as a walk-up clinic or we can use it as a drive-through facility. Individuals have the option of receiving the vaccines inside the bus or staying in the comfort of their cars and the vaccinator will come to them. Aboard each bus there's a tablet that allows for easy registration and scheduling of appointments and actually that follow-up appointment. So it is a one-stop shop. The Vaccine Equity Task Force will continue to work closely with the local health department and use our data-driven approach to, dis to discern where to best use these buses. Again, I would like to thank our partners and the community for working with us as we advance community immunity. As more, becomes, as more vaccine becomes available, we will work quickly as possible to support the administration of these vaccines. Please call 1-88-MD-GO-VAX if you need assistance. Thank you to the pilot primary care providers for their time and resources in this campaign. Much appreciated. And thank you to the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission for launching this funding program to aid in putting vaccine into arms and increasing equity in Maryland. Thank you very much. Maryland, go Vax. With that, uh, we'd be happy to take a few questions. So that's a great question that maybe I'll let our health secretary yeah. address. Yeah, part of the reason we've got the pre-registration system in place is to create the opportunity for people to uh, register in one place and then we will manage that list. With the volumes of people we're expecting, uh, we're going to need that for a while longer. Maybe uh, by the time we get to the fall, we, we're hoping that we'll have vaccine on every street corner or in a pharmacy or through a primary care, and it, it won't be as important. 
Uh, but right now, we need that pre-registration to manage the flow of people. They were careful not to commit to exact numbers. I mean, I, I think um, I told you guys two weeks ago we had a talk with the, um, with the task force, and they said, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of pushed the, the meeting this week. They pushed the time frame back two weeks. So while they encouraged everybody else to move the time frame up, they actually told us we had to wait another two weeks before a substantial increase. We're getting incremental small increases each week, which we're very appreciative of. Uh, but I think we're going to jump to a, a, a really significant level. I don't have an exact number, and they haven't given us final numbers. But I, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be significant. I mean, I really believe that if they deliver on what they say they're going to deliver, that April is going to look a heck of a lot different than March. And that, uh, you know, while we're very close to 50,000 a day, that we, you know, we can get to 100,000 a day. Yeah, I'll let uh, Dr. Hapt maybe try to address that one uh, if he wants to. Uh, it, but this is, again, the pilot program. Just to start this program out, our goal would be to have these vaccines eventually at every one of those uh, primary care physicians and, and, and elsewhere so that you can go to your doctor and get a vaccine. When we get the supply, that's the ultimate goal. Doctor, anything you want to add? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. As I said, this is a 37 is a pilot. It's a matter of... Um, they were selected because, number one, they volunteered. Number two, they were already Immunet capable. Immunet is our state um, registry for vaccines, so they were able to identify their patients who, um, based on this, this registry and, and through our state-designated health information exchange, each one of these practices can tell who's been vaccinated, who hasn't been vaccinated, and also can sort those patients based on their underlying medical conditions, their ages, and, and also their race and ethnicity. So these practices particularly are ready to do that and really ready to lean in um, right now um, on, the, on the equity issue. So they can selectively reach out to those who have been left behind more than others, and they have these relationships. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, and it's, again, very, will very quickly, as the governor said, go from a small pilot to a very large group. Some of the limitation, is, as has already been said, has to do with simply the fact that there's not enough vaccine right now to give to 400 practices, for instance. Um, we, need to, we need to wait till, to, but to, till that time comes when we do have increased numbers, and then they'll be distributed equitably. But these, they represent virtually every place in the state and, and are lean in very heavily on health equity. I'm glad I gave that question to him. That was an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, it, we haven't heard too many reports of that. I would say that would be a very serious mistake. Um, all of these vaccines have, are tremendous. They all surpass any equity, any, any efficacy expectations that anyone ever had and better than just about any vaccines we've ever had in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's such a short supply and such tremendous demand. Anybody that walked away and said, I don't want that vaccine, I want to wait until there's another one, maybe wait in a while. So I think it's, it would be a big mistake. Governor Hogan, this morning um, on the Today Show, Dr. Fauci um, said he, some states are pulling back and opening up now, and he said he is worried about it, that these states are doing this really a little more prematurely than they should. A lot of people listen to Dr. Fauci. Do you think Maryland is doing this the right way in terms of reopening? I do. I think uh, I listen to Dr. Fauci. Uh, you know, I've talked to him throughout the entire crisis for more than a year as I was leading the nation's governors, and I heard, did hear his comments. Uh, and I agree with his comments. I think there are states that are moving too quickly. We're, we're just not one of them. I mean, I, I think states that I've said, the states that were lifting any kind of distancing, lifting masking, uh, are, are making a mistake. 
Um, you know, we're trying to find that right balance. I believe we have. Some states are still have all their businesses closed. They're, they're suffering terribly economically. We're, you know, we're, uh, and, and, and other states are wide open with crowds of people with no masks, and they're suffering the health consequences. We are better than most states in the country, both on our health metrics and on our economic recovery. And that's exactly the balance where we want to be. But we watch it every day. If there are concerns, you know, we're going to make adjustments as we have throughout this. But I believe it's the, estimate, it's the judgment of all of our entire team that meets nearly every day with lots of public health experts and, and people all from inside and outside the government that we are kind of where we should be. And I think maybe, uh, I don't want to be critical of any of my colleagues, but maybe some of them should be where we are uh, rather than on either end of the spectrum. We're sort of right down the middle where we think there's a good balance. So we are um, in discussions with a number of uh, counties, uh, uh, local jurisdictions, in, including Montgomery County, uh, on, as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, that we'll have some announcements shortly in the coming days about additional mass vaccination sites. But, uh, you know, some council members in Montgomery County, I think, jumped the gun and made an announcement that wasn't quite there yet. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we're continuing to talk with them every day. Well, we're going to be talking about that with our health department and with our local leaders. You know, we're just making this announcement today. We want to give them some, some time to digest. And, uh, you know, we'll probably be making further announcements in the next few days. And we're in conversations with all the county leaders almost every day. Um, I'm sure we're going to be having those discussions. But as this supply is increasing and we're, you know, first of all, the county health departments are the ones moving at a sometimes different pace. Our mass vac sites are following the state plan. Pharmacies are, hospitals are. There's only you know 24 jurisdictions, and maybe two or three of them are not in line with the state plan. Um, you know, we've kind of given them some flexibility, but um, as we, I mean, they may get left behind. And as the supply increases, there's going to be no excuse uh, for any county uh, to to not be moving into phase two. I mean, it's. Uh, I understand the concerns early on when we didn't have enough supply, but the supply is going to be pouring in, and uh, it's going to go where we can stick needles in people's arms. And if, if people are going too slow, they're going to they're going to be missing out. Governor, are you confident in the supply that's coming, based on what you've heard from the White House and everyone else, and the way this has all been come out? I'm hoping. Uh, I'm, I am hopeful, I, and I believe that they're. They're being straightforward with us on their promises. Um, I'm hoping even that maybe they're under-promising and that they'll over-deliver, but I can't guarantee it. I mean, we, they did sort of backtrack a little bit um, uh, by saying, I think we, uh, maybe three, four weeks ago, they said for the next week or so you won't get an increase, but after that. And, and then this week they pushed it back two more weeks to the 29th. But I think it's simply a production. The factories are just, you know, cranking these things out and filling the vials. And uh, they, they're, they're pretty certain. I mean, they didn't say we hope to. They said we will be the week of the 29th, which is pretty specific. We're going to get those doses. And the president went on national TV and said he wants to open the eligibility by May 1st. I want to make it clear he didn't say vaccinate everybody by then because they won't have the vaccines. It, that's gonna, it's going to ramp up dramatically in April and then more in May. But May 1 is when you can start to you know, get it going. But I have no control over it. I can only... Uh, you know, hope that what they're telling us is, is factual, and I guess uh, maybe it's trust but verify. We're going to wait and see if they can deliver on the, on the commitments. Last question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You, you can give them the last advice on what they can do to prepare Well, you know, that's an issue that we're having um, across the country, and uh, we're, we're, that's why we have a $2 million uh, 
public information campaign with uh, print ads and television ads and, uh, and every medium we can reach to try to convince people with, you know, I think 20 different people doing commercials uh, talking about the safety of the vaccine. Um, the White House informed us this week that the, I think uh, the president is going to commit $1.1 billion to that kind of a campaign to increase uh, uh, vaccine confidence and to overcome reluctance. Um, so we're going to keep, continue to keep messaging that because, I mean, uh, we, we can't force people to get a vaccine and we understand that there's some concern in, you know, among certain people, but we're going to keep trying to convince them because the only way we really get it under control is to reach some type of herd immunity. We don't have an exact number, different, different doctors and epidemiologists and public health folks have different levels of how many, they, what percentage they think has to get vaccinated before we can stop this thing. But we all know that we have to get as many people vaccinated as possible. That's how we can all get back to, uh, you know, hopefully getting us back to the point where we don't have any kind of limitations and we don't have to wear masks forever and we don't have to worry about our hospitals overflowing and people dying anymore. I mean, that's the goal. And so we're going to just, at every level, I think we're going to continue to try to convince people that this is the right thing to do for them and their families and their neighbors. And, and if, if they want to get, you know, back to the, the way life used to be, uh, a year ago, they're going to have to get the vaccine. All right. Thank you. Thank you.